Annabelle, thanks for uh, coming along to uh, Mind Focus Running and uh, this week's super group session. Um, and it's fantastic to see uh, so many of the team here to, to be involved. Um, I think I first met Annabelle back in 2014 um, when Annabelle was running Coast to Cozy. Oh, yeah. um, and um, I was. Um, I was crewing for, for Mick Flakes um, and Coast to Cozzy, even though it's sort of, it's a major race on the calendar, certainly back then, um, in terms of numbers of people, it's relatively small. Um, and the, you know, there's only about, I think there's 50 people. Is that right, Annabelle? Yeah, that's, I think that's, that's still the number, I think, yeah, because yeah. It's, it's road, it's about road safety, essentially. Yeah. Um, and um, I, th I think we had a bit of a chat af after the race, like it, it's a really social event. Um, and then we didn't sort of touch base again, if I recall correctly, until 2016, which was again at COSI. Yeah? And I think that meeting sort of sums up uh, a little bit in regards to uh, what Annabelle is about. And that 2016, I was, um, I was crewing for Sean Kessler and um, we got to, up to um, Charlotte's Pass, um, which is 20 k's from the finish. Oh, yeah, you do an out and back from there. And we got there about lunchtime, I think I might've been mid morning, I can't remember. But um, you have to realize that like, Cozzy isn't a, a, a huge, you know, uh, huge infrastructure type event. Yeah? So you get to the finish at, at Charlotte's Pass and there's somebody holding a ribbon. And if you're lucky, there's another half a dozen people around and, and that's about it. And uh, anyway, I ran into, into Annabelle and she had set up this little barbecue and she's, <laughs> <laughs> and she, and she's doing a sausage sizzle, right? <laughs> which is amazing like you know like i've been to cozy i don't know six times seven times you never have food at the finish line so mm. there's annabelle with, with with this sausage sizzle thing going um and um um i i had a quick chat to her before uh, sean took took off for the summer and it's about you know two and a half hour three hour journey up and back um, and we came back and um, Annabelle was just starting to to uh, pack things up and and like we we were only very much mid pack and I said I said to Annabelle and I said I said oh, are you finished for the day and she said oh no I have to drive back to Sydney mm. and and um, I, and if my memory is correct you actually drove from Sydney also <laughs> that day no, I think right? I think that year, because I, I I took my daughter, we both um, were up at Charlotte's, um, and I for, I think what we did was we did it. I think we drove from we did something really weird. I I think I remember sleeping at Cooma because I remember my daughter telling me all of these stories about her school camp trip um, down to Canberra. So I think what we did was flew to Canberra. And I, I, my recollection vaguely is that we, I think we flew to Canberra and drew, drove from Canberra to, to Gam, Canberra to um, Jindabyne via Cooma. From, it's, it's all a bit of a blur now, but I, yeah, yeah it would have involved a heap but, of travel. But whatever, anyway. for, for somebody mm. to decide to travel from Sydney to the top of Kosciuszko to cook sausages for four or five hours and then go back. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think that that really sort of sums up a lot of the spirit of the whole ultra community, and mm. and even those runners, uh, those very good runners, like a lot of those guys have that that same sort of spirit. And uh, yeah, so since since then, um, Annabelle and I have been pretty good mates, mainly online, and caught up at I think the forty eight hour at Canberra a few years mm. ago. Uh, but we've done. Uh, plenty of messaging online, which has been terrific. Um, just in terms of background, um, Annabelle 
some of the you, you can have a look at her record yourself on DUV, but some of the races she's done is you know she's run 200 milers in Singapore, the Bengaluru 36 hour race in India. Mm. Why anybody would go to India to run for 36 hours is beyond me. Um, big red run, Belfast to Dublin, mm. a six hour race in South Africa, a 72 hour <laughs> race. 72 hour race in Athens and uh, she's run the, the the six day in Adelaide as well and that's just a sort of you know a little bit of the the experience that she's had and certainly when we're in a COVID free world it's like I don't know Annabelle seems to to race more events than just about anybody that I know certainly in terms of, and she'll just do one long event after a long another long event. I, I don't know if there's any training between those. There doesn't seem to be, but it just seems to be get, getting on, coming coming off one plane and then, you know, two weeks later, getting on another one for another 200 mile event somewhere else. Um, I guess in, in terms of her, her main claim to fame um, was the um, across the years race, which uh, takes place in Phoenix, Arizona, um, every year. And it's called Across the Years because it happens, uh, the 10 day race falls uh, across two years. So it starts in late December and finishes in early January. And Annabelle won that 10 day race with 1,192 kilometers. So averaging 120 kilometers a day. Um, and not only winning the race as first female, but also winning the race outright. Um, and you might need to tell me, Annabelle, but I've, I've looked, I've tried to find sort of 10 day records and they're pretty hard to find on yeah. the net. But I've, but I've gone through DUV and I can't find any woman having run further than that in the last 15 years. Um, Sandra Barwick from New Zealand, uh, who, Ha, who would really be one of the best, if not the best, multi-day female runner we've ever seen. There was a couple of, of a certain era who um, who did some extraordinary things. And Sandra Sandra had um, about, a, she's got a 12.98. I, I was sent a list by the Shreed Shibnoi Marathon team when I was on that race that they'd compiled of 10-day results. Um, and we know there were some people sort of in the 1170s um, so I wanted to take take them. So it was it was which left Sandra way out in front of me. It was beyond impossible. Um, so we, to, to my knowledge, it's kind of the, it was the second the, the best that we've seen. But um, look, I'm aware of at least one other race where someone set a thousand mile record, and we don't have the split for the ten day because that's the nature of the sport. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But. Um... As you can see, it was an absolutely remarkable run. Um, and on top of that, um, you might find it hard to believe that it happened. Uh, we were having a messaging conversation in the middle, middle of the race. Yeah? And I can remember having the thought, shouldn't you be either running or sleeping? <laughs> you, know? yeah, but you can run yeah. a text. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, I think that sums up a little bit of, of Annabelle's attitude. Um, certainly from what I see, she doesn't, she, she isn't totally OCD about these things and she, no. you know, she doesn't take it all too, too seriously. But no. despite all of that, she still has some absolutely remarkable results. Um, that performance won her the Aura Ultra Performance of the Year Award for 2020, and that award's voted on by all of the Aura members. Uh, so it's really recognition by your peers, which I, I think is fantastic. Um, and she also won that award in, in 2018. Um, on Messenger, we've had eclectic conversations on all sorts of topics from politics to COVID shutdowns. But I've looked back to see what running related discussions we've had and they include, they've included chatting about electrolytes while racing in Singapore, shoe changes, people sleepwalking at the Milwaukee six day race, Annabelle being Australia's number one best sleeper, 
the Singapore 200 miler, where she managed to, to find six hours sleep while everybody else was still running and still managed to win, as well as other uh, sleep strategies. We've chatted about run walking. Uh, we've talked about our partners and their acceptance of our overseas trips and time away. Um, Anna Mel uh, has told me that normally she's not goal oriented. Um, and we've also talked about Annabelle running Sydney to Melbourne solo. Yeah. So they might be some thought starters as in terms of potential questions coming up, but please treat the session as having access to one of the, if not the best female multi-day runner in the world at the moment and having the opportunity to ask her anything you like. Um, of course, I'd love uh, some of the focus to be on the mental strategies Annabelle employs in her events. And it's not something we've ever discussed deeply. And that's why I went trolling through, through our, uh, our messenger discussions to, to see if we'd actually touched on it. And I found that we, we had very briefly and that was just before the uh, Adelaide six day race in 2019, when Annabelle said to me, I just need to mentally focus inward, I think on this one and practice compassionate thoughts towards those who annoy me. Um, she won that event with 711 kilometers, uh, averaging 118 kilometers a day. And then we spoke uh, soon after the race had finished and Annabelle said, the next one has to be a Sri Chinmoy event. And I asked Annabelle why that was so. And Annabelle said, the tone, the people, the reason they do it. And um, all of you guys who've been through the, uh, the core sessions, um, you know that I, I do touch on Sri Chinmoy and the Sri Chinmoy events quite a bit. So maybe let's start there, Annabelle. Tell us about where you go mentally and the whole Sri Chinmoy thing for you. Yeah, um, where do I go mentally? On a good race, I do want to go inward, I think. Um, you, what, I, what I don't want to do, um, and for me, it's a bit of a hiding for nothing, which perhaps goes to, to the comment you made about me not being goal-oriented. Um, I'm, I'm not really there to, to, to um, try and, um, you know, wipe the floor with someone else or this kind of thing. Um, and so I, I don't, I, I, tr I really, I, I try to be blissfully unaware of what, what everyone else is doing. I, it, when I started in the sport, I, I, I didn't really like this thing of people looking over their shoulder. I didn't want to do that myself. I can appreciate why people do. And it can, in, in some cases, that, sheer competitive sort of drive can lead people to really great things but it wasn't why I, I started in the sport um, so I guess the goal for me particularly on the longer races um, particularly the six day ones because you are just going around in a circuit you're not worrying about navigation or really anything else it's just you and you and the running um, I do try and just um, well, I try and quiet my mind, I guess, for want of a more more eloquent way of putting it. Um, I, I don't want to be fixated on what other people are doing. You certainly have all kinds of conversations with people during this race. You have a laugh with them a lot because it, it is also ludicrous. Um, but and 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 sometimes you know you do have you you find you've got something in common with someone you never thought you would have, and you do have conversations that perhaps you wouldn't have in in a workplace or even with some of your friends, but you will find that that because you've kind of, you're sort of letting yourself get rubbed quite raw over the six days, you do have these conversations with people. But that said, it is it is about, um, it, it is a, about almost retreating into into myself, into, into just a much quieter place where there's a lot less noise in my own head, um, just a lot less white noise and, um, it's, it's sort of less less anxiety, I guess, um, less hyperactivity in my own brain. Um, that's that's what I want to get out of doing those races. That's what I mean by that. I think. No, no, that, that's terrific, Annabelle. What 
what about your experience with the Shri Chinmoy events? Because like you've, yeah, run the, I, you've run the 10 day in. I think like, yeah, it's like in New York. It. Yeah, I um, so I've done a few of their races. I've done the six day in New York. I've done some of, certainly some of their 24 hour, you know, they were doing the one in Sydney um, for quite some time. And they, uh, the last time I did the 48, they were certainly heavily assisting at that point when Billy was still running the race. The six, the six and ten day in New York is um, yeah it's a really it's it's there's no other race like it that I've I've done and I've I've done a lot of six day races this one is quite unique um, it draws so it, it draws well a very international crowd even by the standard of this race these races you've got people a lot of people from Eastern Europe where there's Sri Chinoy centres um, a lot of people don't speak English. Um, and we all go to um, Flushing Meadows Corona Park, which is in Queens in New York. And it's you might you might have seen pictures of just where the, the big famous tennis center is. Um, we do it in sort of April, May, the weather can be incredibly turbulent and you've got Grand Central on one side, you've got a bit of a lake and you're going around. I think the year I did the course due to civic, civic works, the course was a bit short and you're just, I think it was less than a mile the year I did it. So it's it's not a particularly long loop, but there's a lot of things that make it um, just in terms of the atmosphere quite special. So a lot of a lot of the runners are Sri Chimnoi devotees. Um, they've taken spiritual names and the like. And um, you know, people have got pictures of Sri Chimnoi on their tables. They are reading his work in some cases. Um, I've had people read parts of his his material to me which is and often um yeah quite quite sort of well chosen pieces for the moment um and that th there's a sense where what they're all aiming for is what, what they articulate as self-transcendence which I guess in its broadest terms is is the, the idea that you can go out and do something that you would have it goes beyond your perceptions of what you can do and that's and everyone's really, I, I think it, pretty much everyone who fronts that race is there for that goal, including the, those who are not um, the deputies and so on. Um, and that sense, it just builds and builds as the race goes on. Um, it's it's a really very special race. And there's a lot of, there's an incredible amount of support from the Shi um Centre in New York. So they put on the food, they come and assist, they just provide a lot of a lot of support throughout the um, throughout the event, and it just yeah it does it does escalate. The, we the six day runners start on day four of the ten day race, so there's already some some ten day runners there who are in various states of fatigue, but also really generally enjoying what they're doing. Um, we join them, and then it just goes from there. Yeah, and just, just so everybody knows. Um, what flashing meadows is like mm. and like a, you say flashing meadows and you picture this 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 wonderful tennis stadium and I, <laughs> I was i was there i was in new york two years ago and we went and had a look at the course mm. uh, in case um, um we were potentially looking at running that in the future but it, it is sort of around a lake but number one there's this terrible cold wind that blows across it yeah yeah all right. And you're on the flight path to LaGuardia, so you've yep. got jets coming over like yep. every 60 seconds. Yep. And then you're next to, I don't know how many lanes, but it seemed, seemed like a 10 lane freeway, mm -hmm. like right next to the course. Yeah. So um, in terms of joyful running, it would be pretty difficult just from that, that perspective. But, the, if, but even then, like you think, okay, well, at least it, it, it's on some sort of pavement or whatever. But even that's got potholes in it. And like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, mean, I, I don't know how, how running there at night, you'd be worried about twisting an ankle. Like, mm. it, it's <laughs> by far from perfect condition. Yeah, the year I did it, I mean, it, it rains most years, but the year I did it, the day one of the sixth day, uh, we, had, we had had a heavy downpour that continued. And... 
the, the course flooded and really, unless you wanted to course cut the course you're not there to do, you really had no choice but to run through a very long, big puddle on every single loop. And um, that, that actually, I managed that very, very badly. In my case, I, um, I didn't, I should, have, I should have done shoe changes early on. I didn't, um, didn't change socks. And um, I let this continue for some time. And I started, I've already got a pinch blister that I know how to manage on my baby toe. It's just my, my foot shape, my biomechanics. I, um, I went to the medic station and I thought, these are the guys, these medics also, they look after the, the runners on the 3100 mile or whatever they offer me, I'm just gonna take it. It's gonna be amazing. So I took some sheepskin and wrapped it around my baby toe thinking this would be fantastic. I didn't think to ask how often I should change it. So I left this sodden piece of uh, sheep's wool on my toe for about four days until I started to run a fever and feel, and I knew I was feverish and I thought I've, I've been down this road on more than one occasion. This is cellulitis. I think it's coming from that toe. And by then it, it, it had really macerated really very, very badly. Um, it, it was just a mess to the point, I mean, that sort of, the race unraveled for me a bit. I had a few issues with that race physically um, but that maceration became borderline a deal breaker towards the end. I was taking time off the course and I don't really take time off the course when I'm not sleeping, but I was doing that just to get off the damn toe towards the end of that race. It was a really, that, um, that puddle. And I've done a lot of stuff where I know all about foot care from running in the desert and the like, but I managed this one spectacularly badly, just really did a very stupid thing, leaving something wet on my skin and hoping this would go well. Um, so that, yeah, that really caused me problems. I had a friend from New Jersey who was aware that myself and an Indian runner were both there and were going to do well with cold. So he piled all of his thickest, warmest clothes, drove down to New York um, and gave them to, to myself and this other runner, Arun from India. And I think, I think I'd have been hypothermic if I hadn't had that just for sleeping at night. I was putting on like layer after layer that Sean had given me. And even then I was in a sort of a dorm where they'd given us beds that weren't on the floor. So that provides some protection, but it was, it was just cold overnight and um, yeah, wet and humid, like a cold, unpleasant sort of humidity. Um, but it, it, yeah, I mean, you, you don't look out at the roadway and go, this is really scenic and amazing because it's it's not, it's a lot of cars. At night, it's not a bad thing. It makes you feel like there is life out there with you. The lake, the lake was nice, but you what you'd really look forward to on each loop was coming back to the kind of the camp area where the Sri Chinoy Marathon team had set up. Um, there was a, a sort of a bit of a shrine on the way through, and then there's an amazing food tent that you just would walk through for momentary warmth and respite from it all and just a friendly faces. Um, and then you go through the village and go out and do it all over again. And there were a few people who had handlers. Those handlers would go to the other side of the village. And so there was kind of, you know, a hundred or more metres where you were seeing friendly faces and getting support. Um, and I think you almost spend every loop just wanting to come back to that, to that sort of little home base. More so, more so than on any other race. Um, across the years, it's got like a nice kind of a tenty uh, little village there as well. But um, th this one is, yeah, this one is just, you really do want to keep going back and they have manual lap counters as well. And so as you're approaching, no matter what time of day or night, instead of hearing that irritating beep, what you hear is someone calling out your name because they've got your lap, they've counted you. And there's a whole row of them too. So it's um, it's it's quite special in that way. And I, I, as we started to introduce electronic timing on other races, I thought, fantastic. These manual lap counters, you know, you've got to check they're getting you and make sure that you're looking at them and they're looking at you. But um, in fact, they're incredibly attentive on this race. And it's really, it, it's actually quite special having this whole row of them kind of waving to each and every runner. Is, and, and I guess they get to know us by our gait and everything else. So it's, um, it's quite, quite special. Fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Annabelle. All right, I'm going to open it up to questions, guys. So, um, who's first? Just unmute and shoot. Annabelle, um, oh, thanks for doing the session too. Um, just 
I know it's been a while since you've done like a race and stuff and, you, and you're getting into it. What would be your mindset in the lead up to the week of the event? Where, where would you, your mind be at during that time? Depends on the event for me. So I, to be honest, outside of the six days, I, I don't go into other races with any expectation, um, nor, nor do I. I don't, um, I, look, to be honest, I, I'm quite disorganised and shambolic and I do everything at the absolute 11th hour. So I, I'll be packing. I, I mean, literally, I, I've done races, I kid you not, where I've flown as far as Florida to arrive the night before a race and I've been getting on a plane without a hotel booked um, to, to go after 30 hours of travelling. Um, so I, I, for most races, I don't get into a head zone. I, I do I do get more self-aware with the six day because I guess they're, they're the races I really love doing. And I'm aware just given the sheer, um, just the sheer magnitude of them, you need to, you need to sort of start to centre yourself and focus. Look at as in the last couple of years, I I do think about the race more than I um, used to going into it. I just try and um, oh look, I just I try and settle myself and um, ideally clear my mind and not have a lot of distraction and noise and so on. Um, that's a recent thing, though. I can certainly think of races where I've when I was in journalism where I've been turning up on races and I'm checking stories or I'm checking a page or um, this kind of thing. I left journalism in mid-2018 mid and so I don't, I don't, I'm not checking work frantically the same way and um, that's actually been a helpful thing for me in terms of just disengaging from things and really trying to have a clear head because I can't have a good, I, when I've had really good races I've, I've had a very clear mind at that point going into it. Awesome, thanks, thanks yeah. Okay. Who's, who's next? <laughs> um, is it me? Yep. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering if you had a strategy to stop yourself projecting ahead, maybe on day one or two, if you're feeling less than you'd hope to feel or yeah, um, yeah. whatever, to, to try not to think, oh, my God, if I already feel like this, how yeah. am I going to feel in X amount of time? Mm -hmm. um, Rob's talked to us about that a little bit, but it's obviously something we could all possibly do better. Mm. I could. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess I have a few strategies because I've certainly had races where the body's not been in great nick for whatever reason. And I've, you know, been stupid enough to do races where I'm kind of borderline injured and, you know, it's gone from one thing being a bit niggly to 20 things um, because I've, you know, fronted up anyway. Um Look, a few strategies, I guess. I, I try not to stress on day one um, of any race anyway, because, look, you sort of been dealt the, the, the um, cards you have and you need to, you sort of need to just manage where, where the race is going to be for you. If your body is just not, not doing it, it's, you know, you can't, you can't force it. You can't really change that. So I, I partly I try not to think about it. Um, sometimes I'll just revise where I think I might land downwards. So um, certainly um, that Shreve Simnoy race, I knew I, you know, I was, had had a fantastic race in late 2018, but I knew, I knew I had all these things wrong with me and I needed a break and I went and did this race anyway. Um, so I said to myself very early on, look, if I can get to 400 miles, that's, that's the best that, that's the best outcome I'm going to get. So let's, worked towards that and I worked backwards as to roughly where I might need to be in order to do that but partly I don't think about it and I guess just having done a lot of races I'm always very aware that um, things can change they can come good I've seen I've done I've seen a lot of other people on races where it's not started well or it's started badly um, and things do turn. They can they can come good, even when you think there's no way they're going to come good. And sometimes niggles that you think might be catastrophic, somehow you they 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 turn the corner quite quickly. Um, so I try. I, I look. I, I try not to wallow in it. I guess. I, I think if it's if it's not great and it's in, on an, any objective measure, it's not going to be a race where the numbers are huge. I, I, I think I just go straight for acceptance um, because the finding it is going to be um, 
I've, I've seen other runners when they're having these races where they're in their own heads and they've got these high expectations for themselves and they're making them physically sick with stress. I just, I try and avoid that. Um, so I don't, I don't let myself go down that road of getting overly negative, which is not to say I dispute that it's, you know, sometimes it really the, the race is not going to be great, but I think you just, it, it, they can't all be good or the ones that are good wouldn't mean a lot. I think most of them, most of them we all find it's just not what, what we'd hoped it would be. Um, do you guys have better strategies <laughs> from all of you? <laughs> <laughs> acceptance that's a good one yeah okay who's next me yeah. <laughs> um hi annabelle hey i guess on that note um did you have you found you've always been like that naturally that you've never really gone down any severe negative sort of spirals or found yourself in a really bad place like have you ever had did you start out necessarily like maybe had a couple of bad in, like experiences where you've learned from that um, um or just always kind of surprise, I guess, quite look, crazy. I've, I've done enough of going into bad places um in in my own life and in and, and certainly in, like in in the workplace because I I um was a newspaper journalist for a very very long time and that's um you know it's it's a job that's full of highs and lows you know you get front page story you get a scoop it, it, the world's your oyster and so you get beaten on a story the next day and you are in the doldrums and you know you're beating yourself up because you haven't been on the front page the next number of days or you know all these stories have been down page and you think it's disastrous um having having i i think tried to um I went into the sport not wanting to do that. And it was part of the appeal of the sport was um, having something in my life where I wasn't doing that. Um, so I, I just never let myself to a large extent. I've certainly had races where I've just felt, um, but it's usually, there's usually a physical driver. Well, so, so all, if I'm having a, a really miserable time, either something's physically wrong and often it's just, um, you know, if you let your blood sugar get low, you, you're not gonna have a good time. It's almost impossible. So it can be as simple as that. Um, I've had other races where my heart's not in it and I'm homesick and that's where I get in the doldrums where I've turned up somewhere and thought I shouldn't really be. I think I should be at home and I feel guilty about not being at home. Um, that, that would be where it's, yeah, it's usually homesickness where, um, where I'm in the doldrums. But I, I don't tend to, I don't, I don't tend to be in the doldrums because the race is going bad. I think you've got to just laugh at yourself with a sport like this. Um, and yeah, not, not, not get too, not get too upset. So it was almost a conscious decision. I think I made early on not to, not to do that because I, God knows I do it to well myself in other aspects of my life. So there had to be a limit to, to my doing that. Um, yeah. Right. Mm. Okay, who's next? All right. Well, while, while you think of one, I'll, I'll throw throw one in for you, Annabelle. Um, six day races and ten day races. Um, sleep is so important. Talk. Tell me about your sleep strategies. Like, do you have a set time set? Yeah. Um, or do you just sort of go as hard as you can until you can't go anymore? Or what do you do? I have a, a set time set, actually. And uh, so I, um, in terms of kilometres and what I'm targeting each day, I have a very broad sense of what a good race, what's a reasonable amount and what's too much on any one day. Um, and on a bad race, I, I also know what, what's, what's doable on a bad day. Um, in terms of the actual distance, but in terms of the sleep, I'm I'm actually quite rigid and disciplined about it. I um I I hate sleep deprivation. I I don't like being awake at three in the morning. I find it really difficult and actually kind of soul destroying. Um, I think it can be a false economy to get too tired on these events, and so I um I don't get as much sleep on the first night because I've realised you are going to be a bit hyped up, um, and you're not going to sleep that well that first night. So I don't, I, these days I don't try and sleep, you know, too, too much. 
But after that first night, I'm I'm off the course for anything from four to six hours. It's, sometimes I've been known to go for more when I've just been dog tired. Um, and I, I go down at more or less the same time each, each day uh, and kind of get up at the same time. Um, you know, if something's gone wrong on a race, uh, um, I did one in New Jersey where we, it was, it just, it was really heavy, heavy rain and there was a storm and I think they might've even grounded LaGuardia because of this storm for a couple of hours. It was a really horrendous one. People's tents nearly got blown away. I had to line my tent to keep it from blowing away, but I got completely sodden and, um, and I was, I felt the effects of that for a couple of days. I managed to get an RV delivered to me, which saved the race and saved my life. But I remember the next day just having to lie down in the RV for an hour because I just, that kind of these, these nights freezing cold, it, it just really had taken its toll. That said, most, mostly I just have a, a, a disciplined um, sleep strategy. And look, it works wonders for my um, psyche really, knowing that no matter, even if I'm having just a, a you know, a terrible race, um, at, at some point I'm getting off that course and I'm, going to get some sleep and I'm going to get away from it and there's this big break coming and it can keep me quite sane and even when I'm having a good race I know that sleep is um for me it's it's how I can move well when I am moving um so I've I've I don't think I've ever I can't remember a race where I've ever really run to even on 24-hour races I still tend to get off the course a bit um so I'm really quite rigid about it it's a bit non it's a bit non-negotiable for me Mm. And so, so at, at at what sort of time frame of, of race, like at, you know, what duration yeah. of race race do you think a sleep stop is warranted? So, you know, we've, a lot of the guys here are thinking of running a run for the ages. Mm. Yeah, so we've got that coming up, and mm. and so for me, that sixty one hours. Yeah. <laughs> And and like I've I've gone probably fifty with, with without sleep, and I'm sort uh -huh. of thinking like, what am I going to do? I'm going to go fifty and then have a bit of a nap. Um, and and everybody's got different different sort of times. Mm. You know, what are your thoughts? For me, it's about um, it's about circadian rhythm. So I know that no matter how tired I am, I actually can stay awake and function in daylight hours. But there's going to be a real issue somewhere between 1 and 3 a.m. where I just am in, in the lowest of lows, utterly despondent and just need to get some sleep. Um, so I look, I mean, I have done races where I've, you know, certainly 24 hour races, you're not off the course much. Um, I've done races where there's been nighttime starts and that's it. I've certainly done ones where I've gone through and said, Annabelle, don't be stupid, you can stay awake. But I have done ones where I've I've actually gone off and said, you know, this is a long race. I'm going to get some rest at this very, very early point so that I can still be functioning tomorrow. So for, for something like after, I, 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 how am I pronouncing it? Uh, after, after A. Um, for, for something like your race, I'd be, look, I'd be going... Personally, I'd be going with circadian rhythm. If you've if you've got a strong one, though, like I, I think this is quite individual. For me, I'm I'm just not good at two in the morning. Uh, whereas I've seen other runners who are don't have don't have this. They just seem to be more capable of staying awake. So if you're one of those people and you actually don't mind being awake at two in the morning, I'd I'd get rest early, but maybe maybe you can get to thirty something hours before you need to do that. See, I've, the sleep strategy thing is really interesting. I've seen people who on six-day races will do um, a block of 10 hours and then they do two-hour sleep and they do another block of 10 hours. So they're not seeing the day as a daylight, nighttime sort of thing. They're seeing it as in these, in these discrete 12-hour blocks. Some people love power naps and they can do them for days and it works for them. And so they might be down a bit frequently, but for very short periods. Um, I've, I know of one runner who I think had a fantastic race doing a doing a system that was something like eight hours with I think there were 90 minute blocks of rest um so it really is individual mm. what were have you run coast to coast I mean what worked for you when you did that yeah I didn't sleep 
you didn't sleep and you were okay with that? Yeah. And my crew would beg to differ, but <laughs> I thought I was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, 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 I think, yeah, I think for that, that race that was put, yeah, like that was a 40 hour race. So, mm. yeah, like I can do that. If I were you, I'd, I'd think about, I mean, it's so hard to know, but I'd, I'd be, given your, you'd be a morning start for the race. I think about a bit of rest on night one when you're going to be at your lowest point, but not an excessive amount. Like if you can, if you, if you can, I, I only did a, I did a, me, this was very short. I had an hour roadside at Cedar K. The crew were like, what are you doing? No, go up the bloke arranges and we'll talk about a nap. And I just put my foot down and said, no, this is not up for discussion. You know, lie something little bit. We are sleeping now. We're going to do it. Um, so maybe, so maybe you should go and try and have a sleep two or three for an hour, mm. try and get through day two, because you've broken it up. You've psychologically said to yourself that that first day is essentially done. It's a, it's a new day. Even after an hour's sleep, you're going to feel like it's a new day. And then maybe night two, would you, you'd, you'd have two nights. But yeah, night two, maybe you're getting, you're trying to do a power nap again, maybe two power naps or one discrete block, 90 yeah. minutes or more. Uh, thank but it you. depends what you can tolerate. Yeah, no, I, I know it's really individual. Mm. Um, but I, I remember following your race in Singapore, and that uh, that was like a fat ass thing, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's, 200 it's miles running the streets of Singapore in 33 degrees, you know, 99 percent humidity or whatever it was. Mm. But anyway, I was I was following the the, the Facebook group, and and all of the Singaporeans were were shocked. It was like Annabelle's <laughs> gone to a hotel <laughs> for a sleep. <laughs> and they knew I do this What's because I've been, doing? Yeah, no, no, I was I'd, I'd said to the race, i I've done a few races in Singapore of 200 k and some hundred milers. Um and this was so this was the longest one I'd done. And I'd said to the race director beforehand, look, I'll probably do this. And and he knows from from me having done the 200 k once where I was using it as a C to K training run, but I got spectacularly lost ended up doing far too many kilometers. And so at the 27 hour mark, we had a 9 p.m. start, the 27 hour mark, I rang him and said, I'm like, I'm in a foreign country and I'm not feeling safe crossing roads because I'm a danger to myself. I'm going back to the hotel. He said, fine, yeah, that's, that's fine. Just where are you and tell us when you rejoin. And so um, there were generous cutoffs. That was my first 200K there, I did that. And so I knew that they were quite tolerant of people, you know, they had an honesty system, I guess, that you you tell them where you left and rejoin at same space, same spot. Um, for the 200 mile, yeah, I, everyone else was out there. I mean, it was, we had a, quite a few starters, but very few finishers. Um, there were two men who, um, I think they stayed on the course for most of it. And actually, I, I was the first, I was the only female finisher and the other two blokes came in ahead of me. And then they had, this was great, they had another bloke who didn't make the cut off, but his wife was out there pacing slash frog marching him and, and Ben the race director said look you know he won't have made cut off but we'll kind of sort of acknowledge that he um he finished anyway and he came in perhaps six hours after I think or maybe it wasn't that long but it was some time after we, we were notionally finished um and so he decided to stay with it but it, it, look it wasn't just the sleep deprivation or even being in a foreign country with that one it was just it was a humidity it's just um it's just brutal on the skin. And I, it's really disgusting. I start to smell strange as well. Like, I, I don't know what was happening to my body, but something about those days, long days running in that heat, it just does something to you. And I felt like if I didn't get six hours in it, and, and it was a midwinter, it was midwinter in Australia. So I turned up the night before in this heat and humidity. And um, I just thought to myself, I might, you know, I might die out here if I don't go back to the hotel. <laughs> I wouldn't have died, but I just, I, I don't know how the others were doing it. Those um, little power naps, you know, with, with a crew member in a, in a, in a discreet place. I just, that's really next level, I think. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Has anybody uh, got a question? Yeah, I actually have one. Yeah. Um, Annabelle, I'm actually uh, wondering how you, um, keep yourself motivated, not only during the race, but for training as well, even if 
Bob said you don't seem to train. Don't believe that. <laughs> Um, well, like, yeah, I mean, the training had been doing events for me um, because it, it, it's, 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 it, it, if you're on an event, you sort of, everyone else around you is, is, is doing the distance. So you sort of, it just drags you along, you do it as well. Um, so that was always really until this last year, that was how I would train. The motivation thing is interesting. Um, I, it comes and goes. And I think, I, I don't know what it's like for other runners, but for me, um, I have races where I'm terribly mentally focused and I'm there and I'm, I'm determined to finish um, or I'm determined to get a certain distance. And I, I can kind of really have, have some level of motivation mentally. Um, but a lot of others, yeah, I'm struggling with the motivation and thinking, why am I doing this? But I guess I'm doing it because it's kind of fun at the same time. Um, <laughs> But I don't know, look, if I'm not motivated enough, I'll just pull out of a race. If it's if it's really not happening um, and I'm not feeling it, um, I don't always finish. That's, that's just, yeah, I don't mind a DNF personally. Mm. People have different views on that, but. Mm. And is, is motivation the hardest thing for your, like for you guys, Rob? Is that is that what your group finds the hardest or what's the most difficult thing for doing this sport? No, I don't. I don't think it's. I think everybody's pretty motivated. Mm. Um, um, I, I don't think. I don't think that's the issue. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I'd, I'd be interested to hear um, about um, you know your goal setting and and um, you know if um, you know like it, like I said. You, um, in our messenger conversations, you said you're not goal oriented, and mm. certainly we have big discussions around that, and and how you you know um, you can't turn up in achievement mode for every race with you you performance goals. Yeah. So had, had you know, is you know is there one event where you go okay this is really where I want to perform, and the others are. Are there for more experience, or <laughs> the ones I've turned up and said I really want to perform in ev invariably go pear shaped, and the ones where I've had my best races, I, I haven't had big goals. Haven't really had big goals. So when I did that race in Adelaide in 2018, and I got this 7:42 kilometres, um, I just turned up to have fun, and um, I guess I was in good nick. Um, and I just was running to feel, and I was really enjoying the race. I was having, I was just really happy to be there and the weather was great. And I was just really enjoying being in Adelaide. Um, but I, I did get focused. So I was just running to feel and enjoying it. Um, not wasting time during the day, obviously getting enough rest. And it wasn't, but I did get focused towards the end. A few things had happened. Um, clearly I was having a good race and someone had posted who, runs a site that follows or runs a Facebook page that follows some of the multi days. And they'd said Annabelle's on track out of Adelaide to do what normally happens on Hungary, which is the six day race that's considered the sort of the world championship event. And I think the person that year who'd won Hungary for the female had got about a 720. And he'd sort of said, um, you know, well, Annabelle's probably on track to surpass that. And he sent me just a, a message privately and said look I'm just really proud of how you're doing and I think you know you can you can do better than, than the 720 or whatever the number was um, and so I did it that focused me and I, I certainly rested less that last night than I normally would I thought you know what if I I, I can I can just do whatever it was in an hour 90 minutes sleep and the end is in sight but I think I want to get this bigger number so I was focused on on just getting getting past this uh, other performance in in Hungary because I thought it would be quite special and it certainly surprised me. And was something I never thought I would do to have this race where I'd sort of um, done particularly well that year by global standards and on this on this narrow discipline. Um, so I, I got past that number and then I went, oh cool, I can just walk now and it'll all be over in a few hours and. Um, one of the other Australian runners on the race said to me, well, you know, if you looked at the ladder, if you can get over 738, 739, it'll put you second under to Partly Cunningham. Very well known and really exceptional. And I went, oh, right. I didn't realise, <laughs> I hadn't looked at the ladder because I'm a bit disorganised. And I said, do you think that's doable? And he said, yeah, I think you just, just need to start running again. And so 
Um, that last couple of hours on that race, I did. I just ran because um, I thought if I can, this is probably the only chance I'm having at getting a, a shot at number two on the Australian ladder for the female six day. I'm just going to go for it. And um, so, so it was it was a, it was a shifting of the goals during the event, and it was gone. It went from just having a great time to someone put something in front of me that was achievable, that's kind of it had meaning to me, and then someone later to that put something further in front of me and um, I guess I responded to that I then turned out to Adelaide the next year thinking that the universe owed me like another great race at Adelaide and this didn't go well for me I very rarely set big numbers or say you're going to do really well but I went into that one going Annabelle you are here to have another blind river race and um, it really it really didn't work for me and it especially this is going to sound so so stupid really but I got to the 72 hour mark and I was like, we took um, splits, we had sandbags and we could drop them at the 72 hour mark. They sounded an alarm and they would measure where you were at to the meter. And I was something like 15 or 100 or something infinitesimally small, short of 400 kilometres. And something about that just seemed profoundly unfair and it, it just darkened my mood for the next couple of days because it was like, why couldn't I have a 400k split? Why was I a bit short of that? Um, so it, it was a time when trying to set, it put pressure on myself to do well um, and have goals really didn't work for me. And I spent the next three days, the weather got progressively hotter. We had it smashed with a very hot day and it just it just all felt so unfair. Um, I just thought that, that it was owed to me somehow to have a better race than I was having. Um, so that's a time I've set a goal and it's really, you know, I've come a cropper for doing it. It didn't, um, it, it didn't, I, I probably would have got a better distance had I not been putting that pressure on myself. It just, I was in, in my own head in a bad way and um, it just kind of made me feel cranky and like, when's the three days up? And um, with, yeah, with, when I did across the years, the 10 day, I, the only goal I had was I thought it's a 10 day race you know, you, people want to get to a thousand kilometers with that. And so that was the goal. But then I found I was just running so well that in during the race, I started to say, well, what, what's the six day mark? What's a realistic one? What's one I'd like to get? Um, and then kind of worked and then then looked at the thousand K split and what, what I could do on that. Um, and so I, I, I set goals during the event and it did mean literally I was googling a few things to try and get some some numbers and benchmarks and then some people had sent me a few spreadsheets that had been compiled of 10 days and and sort of thousand miles a thousand kilometers the like um so I I've set goals on the run really on the fly during events um and that's worked for me better because it means I'm not going in there with a lot of pressure but if I'm having a really good race, you can bring that pressure to bear. It, it can help you um, to sort of stay focused and have something that you know you're working towards and to work backwards a bit in terms of what you're trying to do each day. Um, but I don't, I don't do that on most races. I certainly don't on a 24 hour race, for instance, Th those just are what they are for me. Um, and similarly with the 48, it's always nice to get a certain distance, whether, you know, female, I guess you talk about 300 miles, the 300 kilometres, perhaps. Um, but I don't, I don't get too hung up on that. You sort of know it's special, what's something that might be a nice benchmark, but um, going in there and saying, I want 180, I want 190, I want 200, I think that can be quite fraught because you're just, you're sort of a bug under glass trying to get this, um, get this distance in this time and I don't know how you do that and then enjoy the race and just be calm and centered because you're just looking at your clock and benchmarking yourself every hour or but obviously it no. works for most it works for a lot of people to be really yeah but no thanks Annabelle because like the, the sessions we've had discussed that that very point and I find a lot of my time is spent detraining people about this massive goal thing and this massive pace chasing um, and um, yeah I, I, I think I think your explanation of how you go about it is is just about perfect you know? 
And you know, like, like I say, if you're trained up for it, you're likely to run well anyway. I mean, you, you don't need this, this massive, these massive goals that, you, that you've set that you need to be chasing. You know, because mm -hmm. what I find is if, if, if your body's right and your mind's right, it will just happen. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's at the tail end. I even watching Canberra on the weekend. Um, Cheryl Simons had that amazing race. She got two hundred yeah. miles, which a female was very special. And it was. I tuned in towards the end, and it was really interesting because it looked like from all the pictures, and I had one of her crew was sending me some pictures of her, and she just looked really happy and really centered, and um, she just seemed to be enjoying herself. From what I could see. Uh, and it, it was the last few hours where you could see that she had to focus to, and really had to move at a quite quite a decent clip to get that 200 miles. Um, so it, as an observer from afar, it looked to me like she'd really focused in those last few hours and got herself there. But she was rare, she was ready to, to do that anyway, I think, without, I don't know, I haven't discussed it um, in any real detail with her other than to say what a good way she had. But I do, I do think that sometimes what you see with people, they kind of, Later on, they realise, yeah, this is where I'm going to get to, and and it, it can focus them. Um, but it it is that thing of if if it's if you, your legs and your mind are ready for it, you don't necessarily need to. I don't know. Maybe I mean some people do, but I'm not a fan of um, too much pressure. When the the, the race, the, all that running is stressful enough, really. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Any has anybody got a last question? Yeah, can I? Um, Annabelle, you mentioned the Adelaide um, six-day race. Do you have any particular tips, insights, or um, any suggestions for that particular race? Um, prepare for anything with the weather. Adelaide weather is volatile. And I've done three six days in Adelaide now, and I've all at the same time of year, and I've had extreme heat waves where your shoes are all but about to melt. And then I've had like cold, nasty, um, you know, downpours. And so, so actually packing well would be something I'd advise. And I, I think, um, not, you know, you, you will invariably see people who go out too hard, too fast early on in a six day and not getting swept up in that, I think is, um, is quite important because it's very tempting. You feel fresh, you feel like your, um, your legs are ready for it, but six days is a long it is a long race you do need to you need to pace yourself and not um not go out too hard too early because you see you do see a bit of that on these events how's the on-course catering at that one um it's look i think last year from memory we didn't have meat um was the year before we'd had we had had it i think i made it available when some of us wanted it and asked for it but it was look it was fine i mean i i never have crew and i was well fed the whole time you always want to have you, you definitely always want to have um if, if there's treats or things you know you're going to want then you need to bring them yourself yeah. um because you can't be expecting people to go and find them for you and um but it's yeah that's fine mm. Mm. fantastic Right, so just so you know, Annabelle, Charlotte's entered in the six day. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, I hope so. I hope so. It'll be fun. Yeah, it is. It is. Trust me. <laughs> Guys, it's um, well past 11 Sydney time. So um, we spent uh, just over an hour. Um, and uh, I think it's been an absolutely fantastic session and, and it's been wonderful to, certainly for me, to, to have many of the philosophies that, that we share here um, sort of um, supported by you know, your approach and, and the way you think about, about your events and your running. Um, um, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it's been, been a terrific session. Um, so hopefully, if we're COVID-free, you might come across for a run for the ages. Yeah, I'm liking, I'm liking the looks of it. Because um, I just don't feel like I've done anything crazy. Like the Singapore races are all crazy, and there's a few others that I've done that are just really quite um, 
just a lot of fun for and people just go there to have a ball really and I think this one stands to be one of those I do like I do like the quirky nature of what that race is about <laughs> I'm 48 I think I'm the worst possible age to even contemplate it because the, the leg speeds not you know you you because you're competing aren't you against 40 out 40 year olds who are faster and younger and then everyone over 48 has got that extra time um so it almost seems like the right time to hop on board that wagon when it's invariably it's just going to be as bad as it gets <laughs> fantastic yeah look <laughs> I definitely hope you can make it. It would be fantastic and be wonderful for uh, some of these guys to be able to share some laps with you. I'm certainly looking forward to it. Yeah, it's, it's shaping up. It's looking like it could be a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks very much, guys. We'll, we'll end it there. Thanks, everybody.